Welcome to Inclusion Podcast. In this episode, we are joined by Oliver Lansley and we're going to be talking about representation in the arts. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this. Inclusion. 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 Inclusion Podcast by the Centre for Inclusive Leadership. Well, Ollie, thank you so much for thank being Thank you for here. having me. It's been... I think I've been trying to negotiate this for the last... <laughs> <laughs> Very bad at diary management. I'm going to put that out there right now. I wake up in the morning and I go, right, where do I need to be and how do I need to be? And I'm really glad that I checked as well because the the venue in my diary is not this venue. Oh. <laughs> but I remembered you saying we've, it's in... It's in like, <laughs> not really before I, no, it's fine. It's fine. Before I go to in. this other place, I'm just going to check because that would be something that I would do. Yeah, we had two venues. So, so the first one, and then there was an update. <laughs> but then I, I mean, to be, to be honest... I pr- you probably could have, it wouldn't have made any difference because I was probably always going to ask you. <laughs> yeah. I'd just like, wake up, where am I going? Great, I'll go there now. To be fair, we had one guest a few months ago go to our office. Oh, yeah. You they remember? were just outside going, yeah, I'm ready to go. I'm here, I'm ready to go. And we're going, uh, you're, you're where? You're where? Oh, What's your office yeah. address? <laughs> I feel like you've got my heart going. I've, I've been, that's been me many times. Yeah. It was great, though. <laughs> so we're going to do a bit of an introduction mm-hmm. for people that don't know you. Um, you are a writer, director, performer, um, and you work across stage and screen. Mm-hmm. And you have Wild Child, and I was a beneficiary of that, um, which is an amazing organisation that um, program that supports underrepresented underrepresented writers break into the industry. Um, so we're definitely going to talk about that. It was um, actually amazing, and you did uh, an incredible showcase yesterday. Um, for the newbies that you've got yep. who are just thriving, which is wonderful. Um, and you've also got, and I'm going to say, I'm going to say it wrong, Les Enfants. Tell you. Mm-hmm. Very good. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, you finished it. <laughs> um, I, mean, it's like I, I named that theatre company when I was a pretentious 19-year-old and I've been stuck with it ever since. But the fun thing is, is that you, everyone else has to say it as well. And it's, it's quite fun. There's a lot of things that I did as a young person that oh, I have to take yeah. responsibility for. Yeah, and now you're like know. 20 years old, like you're a grown up, and you still I didn't going, want to say that. Do you I do didn't... the French accent? Do you do <laughs> like <laughs> something I did when I was a youngster that I'm taking responsibility for, <laughs> or someone? <laughs> but seriously, <laughs> but Les Enfants is mm. a groundbreaking production company. One. Uh, Olivia, sorry, Olivia nominated uh, uh, for Alice's Underground. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and you've got a show coming up, haven't you? We do. We have a, a, a theatre show, a normal theatre as opposed to Alice, which is we do a lot of immersive stuff, but we have a big musical based on a best-selling book called The House with Chicken Legs, which is coming to the South Bank Centre in Next week, I think. Well, I think we yep. open on the 13th of December, which is so, um, it's actually the the first time we've done a stage show for years and it has been so nice, you know, just, just doing that thing that you started with and the kind of remembering all of that experience and making theatre in that way. And also having just been doing lots of immersive stuff just to be like, oh, I'm, I can sit in a seat and there are lights and there's a mm-hmm. stage and, you know, all of the things that you have to work around when you're making in found spaces. So, but yeah, I, it's, I love the show. It's about a, a young, it's basically about grief. It's a beautiful book about a, the the kind of based on the folk tales of Baba Yaga, about this girl who lives with her uh, grandmother who is a Baba Yaga who guides souls to the dead. So it's one of those books which is sort of beautiful because it, it, it finds a way to allow young people to talk about death, which I think particularly after, you know, the f- few years that we've had is mm. is essential. So, yeah, it's a lovely show. Come and see it. Yes. <laughs> Come and see it. How long is it? How's, how long is it run? We're on for, uh, basically we're on, it's only about three weeks, I think. So we're on from the 13th of December up until the 30th, I think, yeah, in the Queen Elizabeth Hall in the South Bank Centre, yeah. Enjoy. Which is a beautiful space as well. It's a musical. It's family. Everyone can come. It's a great, 
you're going to be coming. I'm well, coming. I, I, we'll have to put this out as a trailer because this doesn't go out till February. <laughs> 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 so we'll do a teaser. Well, on the guys, show. it was great. <laughs> it, it was, was wonderful. Really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's true. No, I will be going though, of right. course, absolutely. And then when I was doing my research on you, because it's weird researching somebody that you know. <laughs> So I've no idea what comes up when you research <laughs> yeah. me. Yeah. I told you it's a friendly show. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't realise that you were in Sherlock. I was, yeah. Okay, so Vigil, I think I maybe knew that you were in that. Doctor Who. Yep. Oh, yes. Sorry, and I got to do the Vigil thing. You're in Vigil with Patterson. Yes. Oh, that's so nice. Patterson is... Big friend. friend. Oh, wow. Yeah, Fantastic. big friends with Patterson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Have you seen his current show? Boats no, there. I haven't, but I've heard it's very, very good. It's very clever. Yeah. Very, very clever. Sorry. No, no, no. It's great. Um, and Flack, which you wrote. I did. As yes. well, which I knew that. And something that you know, so that you played Kenny Everett. I did. Oh, <laughs> that was my favourite job ever. That is really? Yeah. Done in the best possible test, I assume. <laughs> it was, yeah. I've, got, I've actually got the Cupid stunt dress. They made me one with the giant boobs and the no. yeah the whole thing really? the blue Sorry, dress hands as well you got the yep, hands. i didn't well, no the, the the hands are in uh, mammoth's production office the giant but i did have the giant hands but i didn't get to keep those but i did get to keep cupid and the had giant bosoms that so is that hilarious. which i uh, and i i have I, it's not in, currently where i'm living but like where, where i used to live i would have it on a mannequin and then and then when like when you have like someone come around to deliver a washing machine, why would you do? Then that, you're yeah? like, how is this? <laughs> this is brilliant. really complicated to explain. So maybe I'll just put it in my office yeah. in future. Good idea. Good idea. <laughs> and also, we have to mention uh, that you are the writer and exec producer of Where's Wanda, which is yeah, which yeah. is wild. So. Uh, Apple's first German language show. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and no, I don't speak German. I was going to ask you that. I did do German GCSE. <laughs> so I'm did I. I'm trying to learn it. So I write it. I, so it's a very complicated thing. I was working with Apple Europe. So Apple Europe is sort of the same team. They had this show, this idea that they really loved, um, and they but they wanted to go a slightly different direction with it. They asked me if I'd have a look at it. Uh, so the, the idea is this family their teenage daughter goes missing, 17-year-old daughter goes missing. And so the mum and dad decide to try and find her. They are going to bug the whole neighbourhood. Oh, my God. They put bugs in all of their neighbours' houses. And um, and I was like, that is <laughs> a fun idea. Because then it becomes, the, so, you know, it's, it's although it's about a missing teenager, it's not, it, it's funny, it's dark. Like, yeah. we've started to get a few, like, almost Twin Peaks references, which um, I love. So it's kind of about what, the what hap what goes behind closed doors that you're not aware of but there's also this sort of mystery at the heart of it but it's been so much fun but it's I, I write it in English and then there's a I have a dramaturg which they do in Germany which we don't really do in this country but I I have no idea why we don't dramaturgs but is like we yeah. we have it in theatre but not in television but I have a wonderful dramaturg who works with me and then it gets translated into German then we have a polisher and then we have like an onset person and then it goes to the directors and the actors and then it gets shot and then it gets sent back to me with subtitles that have been generated by AI <laughs> so I sort of read these oh, words oh, which yeah. are like an approximation of something that I read right. so it's very strange but but also weirdly I feel like it is the most me out of most of the TV shows that I've made. I think my, my theatre company, you know, probably why I've got a pretentious French name, like I've, I've always been very, very inspired by like a European sensibility. There's, I love yeah, yeah. like absurdism and all of that. And actually, weirdly, there's something about this making a European show like this that has sort of worked and yeah. feels like a good fit. But I, I'm very, very excited about that coming out next year. Wait. It's going to be good. I can't yeah. wait. And Amazing. what's great is that the English language is quite close, isn't it, to German in lots of ways. So it doesn't feel like a massive leap where some but bits might. Well, it's interesting. Like, I think a big thing with like what streaming has done in is now we're just so much more used to like shows are now international in a very different way. Like normally you would make a show and then you would sell it to all these different territories and it might go on in America or this place or the other, which meant you may, would make a lot more money as a writer, part of the, mm. the writer's strike thing that just happened. But now if you make a show for Netflix, if you make a show for Apple, 
like essentially immediately it's on all over the world you know like and and it's on yeah. it's on all over the world at the same time that at, at the same time yeah you know it's not like a show where it used to be you make a hit in the uk and then it would i mean even like 10 years ago you made a hit show in the uk the americans would remake think about the office you know yeah. like an english language show but they will still remake it as the american show now it feels like that is is so different like Lupin I don't know if you watch Lupin on Netflix no. that's an English writer okay. that's a French show and you know with I think one of the reasons why maybe Apple wanted me to work on it because they you know then it's their first German language show but they're seeing it as an international show whatever yeah. that means as opposed to like a German show so I think there's this very interesting thing now about things being crossing uh, you know whether it's squid games or mm -hmm. money heist there's so many shows now that we just get used to to it, it, it's not a barrier whether it's subtitles or whatever it is it's not a barrier um in the way that it used to be but what is interesting about the way that international people um have different you know consume different media is in germany they dub everything Right. So all the German shows, they're so used to all of the Western movies. And so it, it's it's a complete dubbing culture. It's not subtitles. But what's really funny is it means that now they've got these really famous people who are like the voice of Robert De Niro. Is <laughs> He's like famous as Robert De Niro. And people in Germany, like if they, if they heard, when they hear Robert De Niro speak, they're like, that's not. Robert De Niro. <laughs> That's funny. It's, so they've got so there's so you've got these like mega stars who are the voices of Leonardo DiCaprio and Marco Robbie. And I just that I find that absolutely fascinating because it's the same actor that's that's been playing them for all that. So you have this weird connection to these people, and then they hear like Robert De Niro doing an interview, and they're like, "Who's? Why is he talking in that weird voice?" That is funny. Isn't that yeah. Interesting. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and some people—that's their career. That's their whole career is being. Oh my god! Our, but I, the, the, my favorite thing is—I think this is correct. I think the guy who does Robert De Niro also does Al Pacino. <laughs> so then, in Heat, he was—it was like that is hilarious. It was this weird chamber piece where it was suddenly like. <laughs> <laughs> I find it so interesting, and it just—but it's just such a different thing culturally whereas like we don't really I think maybe maybe dubbing is starting to come in a little bit more but yeah I, it's those little details mm. that are fascinating when you start to with these big global companies and they start rolling things out I swear that you sort of see these little idiosyncrasies about the way that different people consume their media I think it's fascinating Gosh, we've come a long way, but also you've come a long way. That's my segue. Nice, I like it. Um, nice. <laughs> <laughs> and we're always interested in like origin stories, your story, mm. inclusion story. Um, so I guess I will kind of begin there, you know, because you write and support, you help people write and support theirs. Mm. So where does where does that come from? You know, what's yeah, I think mine. <clears throat> I think mine is sort of complicated in a way in the sense that I come from like on the one hand I come from a very privileged background and you know I'm white I'm male I live near London um you know I, I have a you know family who's always kind of been there and cared for me and like so I've, I've got a lot of privilege in that sense um but then also I suppose I never might say my dad was like none of my family had really gone to university before my sister actually went um well done Rach I didn't, <laughs> I didn't go but my parents didn't and like they're so like my dad was a builder and worked you know my mum worked for the NHS so that so there wasn't like a a sense of how to access yeah. this sort of world I think when I started it was a very different time so like when I, I was just obsessed with theatre when I was, you know, I just loved theatre and plays and, you know, like I had very, some very good people that supported me. So I had the drama teacher at my school, Dave Morris, who I still see now. We went, he we went out for whiskey last week and we kind of, I still see him and he was an incredible mentor, but like, 
gave me it gave me a space you know i would go at lunchtime i would go and sit in the drama studio and i would read plays and i would like read burkoff and wow. brecht and stuff you know i don't i know like what an idiot like what a weirdo <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know why i don't know but i think there was something about that it was so different mm. to my world and i and i remember like i got i just fell in love with this sort of this European absurdism stuff, which was different to like, because also there was like, you know, I would read stuff like Pinter and yeah. Yeah, there was a big, like, it was very like kitchen sink drama and all of that yeah. stuff. And I was like, well, that I feel I, I, I recognize that world. So why would I want to like tell those stories? Like, I want to, I, you know, I want to see these huge, different, fantastical stories and worlds that, that, are, that are different from my life. So I would, and I had another, ver you know, there was a, a woman called Janine who ran like the local stage school thing at the weekends. And so my parents were like, okay, well, you can afford to go to the acting class on the, on the sort of Sunday afternoon. So I went to the acting class and then basically Janine just sort of fell in love with me and let me stay all day on Saturday and all day on Sunday and like didn't charge me for it. <laughs> and so that was amazing. So I just, it was like completely my escape, I think, when I was younger. And then I started getting into theatre and like making it, I suppose, you know, like I, I was that annoying kid that w during the summer holidays, I convinced Dave Morris to let's have the drama studio and we I put on Romeo and Juliet, obviously cast myself as Romeo. <laughs> uh, basically after Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet, just just like completely ripped that off, but, um, but <laughs> produced my first show. I oh, wow. wow. And then... What I know now that I didn't know then is like a couple of years ago, I, I was diagnosed with ADHD, mm -hmm. which was like, oh, OK, <laughs> that sort of makes sense. But I suppose at the time, I, you know, that th what that the elements that that brings into your life is sort of. I suppose makes you feel a little bit. Different, so like I never I never I suppose my affinity with people now you know wild child it's called wild child because it's that thing where you're like you just feel a bit different and you act, and you act a bit different and it's really useful but it's also you're just you're slightly off <laughs> you know just slightly off the main drive yeah <laughs> and um <laughs> and i think that's how i always felt and i think that's sort of always what motivated me and so then i so i, I uh, even at, 15, 16, I was like, I want to, I, I was so desperate to do it. I was so impatient. I didn't want to go. The idea of going, and of course my parents were like, you should go to, this was, you know, during, God, it would have been like during the time when uh, new labor in, it was like, everyone go to university. <laughs> Doesn't right. matter what you do, you know. And I, but I was like, hang on, wait, but then like three years at university. And then if I wanted to go to drama school, then that's another three years. And then also like, how on earth? would you pay for that how do how do you know it, even though at the time it was much more affordable than I think it is now but still that idea of spending all that money and where would I find where would I get it and then being like but I don't want to wait six years I want to do it now mm. and so I left I I left school um and I managed to get through the wonderful Janine who ran this associate Italia Conti school and managed, she, she basically then hooked me up with the main school and I managed to get a full scholarship there. Oh, wow. Three year scholarship. And I went there for a year. <coughs> and then after a year, I was like, great, this was fun. But I think, I, <laughs> I think now I need to, it was great. It was a musical theater and it was, it was wonderful. And again, I had a, found another drama <coughs> teacher there called um, Lisa, who was very inspiring and was brilliant acting teacher. And then, I got really, I just had one of those moments where it was like, there was a thing then called PCR. I don't know if you remember PCR as an actor. It was like a printout on red paper, which I assume was so that you couldn't photocopy it. And like, this was pre, I oh God, this makes me sound old, but like, it was, I don't know if it was pre-internet, but ba basically it was this <laughs> personal casting report, which you ordered and it came in the post and it was like stapled together red paper and it was just full of auditions for shows. Oh, Wow. And I remember seeing, and I, I never, like, you never got anything out of it. You never got auditions out of it or anything. But, like, I remember seeing this thing for someone was auditioning for Greek, which was a Stephen Burkhoff play. And, yeah. again, Stephen Burkhoff was one of those pieces that I kind of got introduced to when I was at school. And he wrote 
the stuff that really spoke to me was like he rewrote, you know, well, wrote, Edgar Allan Poe yeah. and and yeah. Greek tragedies, but he rewrote them in East End London. Yeah. And and it was to me, it was it just because it it was I recognised that world, but it was also. It, it wasn't a kitchen sink story. It was Oedipus. It was this. And, I, you know, yeah. I've just found it. I, I loved it. And it was all white white face makeup and mm -hmm. expressionism and kind of physicality. And I, so I'd kind of, that had always stuck with me. And I saw this advert and I was like, okay, I'm going to leave and I'm going to go and do that job. <laughs> Which now I look back and I'm like, what? There's like two times this has happened to me. And the second one actually is possibly the Kenny Everett thing. But I, <laughs> I was just like, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. And it was Greek, his, his, which was his retelling of Oedipus. And I went and I auditioned and I got the lead role somehow. And then so I went off and I did this show Greek, which was in uh, the Landau Pub Theatre mm -hmm. in Clapham. And again, this was a time when theatre criticism was a completely different thing. You know, you got you got a five star review in Time Out or the uh, the stage and that was it yeah. you sold out you know like the it, that was the power of of theater criticism that we don't have anymore because we've got which is maybe a good thing or maybe not a good thing because we've got so many um blogs and this and that and the other that like but there was a that time where like if you got that five stars the same in edinburgh like if you got five stars from scotland the whole mm. run would be sold out so i did that and we transferred to the riverside studios and then I got myself an agent and it basically just sort of started off there. And then I ended up, basically, then I was like, okay, I wanted to work with the director again. The <laughs> the theatre company that we made Greek with, they, they did their first season and they did like five shows. And all of the other shows <laughs> tanked apart from Greek, which did really well, but they went bankrupt. So I wanted to work with the director again. And so I was like, well, I'll produce it. How hard can that be? What even is a producer? Um, and so then we did another show. And then again, like I, I basically I started writing because I, I didn't have any money to pay for the rights to do other people's plays. I wanted to do I wanted to do another, but I wanted to do Metamorphosis. But I was like, I can't, I can't pay for the rights. So again, I'll write something. I'll play Romeo. How hard can that be? I'll produce it. Sure. <laughs> I mean, the that the magic of youth, right? The arrogance Brilliant. and the the joy of it is 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 uh, extraordinary. But that and that effectively then became what what started to become Les Enfants mm -hmm. off the back of that show when it had transferred to Riverside Studios, who ran the assembly rooms in Edinburgh. The next show we did was West, which was another Burkhoff, which which we kind of which is his Beowulf, and we set it in a in a jazz club in the space mm -hmm. in the Isle of Dogs. I yeah. don't you know there. I see. Which I found because my dad was was the site manager on a building site opposite, and if you know my dad, he is the sort of person that will go into. He just will go into everywhere and talk to them and talk about his son and be like, so you just get these random things like, oh yeah, I spoke to your dad. I hear you're running a theatre company. You want it, but you know, fair play. He yeah. put me in touch with them. They and they basically they gave us the space. We did we did it at the at the um in the space in the Isle of Dogs and then assembly rooms took us up to Edinburgh and then I had my first experience at the Edinburgh Festival and I was like, wow, yeah. this is this is it. And then. Almost for pretty much the next 20 years, we went to the festival. And then the, the theatre company kind of started to grow through that. And I started writing television a bit. And so, yeah, it all, but it all kind of came out of that. But I think that is speaks for my, the way that I want to, I don't know how possible that route is now. Because yeah. to just put, shows on now is so prohibitively expensive when I think about it like I go the fringe like the London fringe shows that world that I worked in you would you know you would you were working with theatres and they were like okay well look whatever we get in the tickets we'll split it you don't have to come mm. you know now like even the smallest fringe theatres you're talking about putting down you know all this money same with the Edinburgh fringe when we started in the Edinburgh fringe I think our entire budget including accommodation and everything was like a cup a, a grand a couple of grand now you really? can't get an apartment for you know, a four-person apartment for less than five grand and it's just 
you don't have the opportunity to to find that route you know to just go i'm going to make a show and it's going to be it probably it might be absolutely dreadful but that's okay like I'm, that's how i'm going to learn and i'm going to make another one i'm going to you know like with with les enfants for the first few years we, it was basically like if we make money on the show it means we've got some money to do the next mm -hmm. one <clears throat> but now i think you know it's so hard because that fringe scene and edinburgh are just so prohibitively expensive that those young people like me just don't have those opportunities and like and we you know there there were we try and counteract it i suppose with schemes and this that and the other but ultimately everyone wants to be it 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 becomes everything becomes gate kept in a way mm -hmm. and actually what you want it, ultimately is to be able to find your own path and find your own route of expression and learn about you know like so even if you get like one of these great big schemes as an artist it's like if i it took me a long time to figure out how to do things yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know i wrote a lot of crap before i wrote any good stuff and i made a lot of mistakes and i think what we have less and less is for young people is is that ability to make mistakes like in everything mm -hmm. even now you go you know you think about a musician or a singer songwriter they would write songs and they would play them in their bedroom and then they would do them at school and then they would mm -hmm. go and play an open night nowadays you're straight on youtube mm -hmm. and you're straight there there's no it's hard to like, for, and, and, and of course, uh, as you know, really to be an artist, it, there has to be a confidence. If I could give anyone the confidence that I had as a 19 year old, <laughs> if I could find that confidence again to be like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to do Romeo and Juliet and I'm going to play Romeo. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, who, where do you get that? But that's what you need. You do need to have that it's, it's hard, it's so hard. You need to have something to drive mm. the train. And I think that is what is so easily, is one of the biggest challenges actually I find with Wild Child is the biggest thing is giving people confidence and community. Like, mm. and actually like with Wild Child, people do it, you do it to each other. Like everyone's like, oh, I've got to do a pitch, I've got to write something. And everyone's like, yeah, you've got this, this is great. I'm going to read your script for you, you know? Yeah. That is what people need. It, you need you need to be safe to be an artist you need safety and like there's not much of that in the world it's, these days it's really interesting to hear you talk about that it's, and thank you for sharing that it's just fascinating and i was thinking as you were talking about the exactly that piece that you create these kind of community of artists and i was thinking um of course i know chantal's story obviously um and i I think you do. Whatever that thing is you had at 19, you managed it. It's contagious because you certainly gave it to Chantal and it sounds like yeah. you gave it to the rest of the company. And why I'm so interested in that is because listening to your story and you talking about, you, you very candid about privilege, which was interesting. Mm. And I think it was fascinating to hear you talk about that. Um, but then, of course, as you were rightly said, there was that was privilege within a within mm. a relative context, because what's interesting about the world that you live in, the world of the arts and media and the arts is it's one of the elite occupations. Right. Yeah. And and literally the only people that can afford to, uh, can afford to work in it are the people that don't need to absolutely <laughs> don't need to yeah. work <laughs> because yeah. the reality is that's hard going. And, you know, every actor, you know, is working in a call center somewhere, yeah. you know, killing themselves for 10 hours a day. You you knew the story yeah. i don't have to tell you but i'm really interested in um why it is that you have taken such a, your heart has opened so much to underrepresented talent um and uh, we work we're very fortunate ollie we've got some of our clients uh, the biggest of the busy, biggest you know we work with bbc we work mm. with sky we work with amazing people like sister pictures and so on so we work with some fantastic mm. organizations but i'm very conscious of the fact that um the problem of underrepresented talent is a kind of gnawing problem, right? Mm. So tell me, tell me why that matters to you. Because when I listen to your CV, you're doing everything, right? So how do you find time, and why do you find time I mean, for that? I think it. I think you're right. I think that's such a accurate way to describe it as a gnawing problem. But I think I think it's a gnawing problem in our world and in our society. Like I, I think, it, you, you know, it depends how deep you want to get into it. But I think you could 
put a lot of the problems with what has happened over the last five years comes down to, you know, I think it's interesting when you talk about like inclusion and diversity. And I think diversity has become a sort of, it's one of those words that now doesn't really have any meaning anymore because it's like mm. this. But actually, if you think about it in 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 its simplest sense, is like a diverse set of minds looking at a problem. It's like when they just. It's like when, um, when they were creating seatbelts, and because all of the the scientists doing it were men, all of the crash dummies were male bodies, and so they they made seatbelts, and no one at any point was like. Oh, women are might be a bit smaller or have boobs or they yeah, yeah. and so the and so you end up with with a system that that only works for yeah. certain people yeah and like it like in its simplest form to me is like every anything is is improved by there being a diverse sense of ideas and conversations around a subject and I, I you know like you can do it talk about it hugely in politics and the politics of the last five years where you go no matter how clever or you know or, or, or educated or this that and the other you've got a bunch of people that essentially all went to the same school mm. making judgments about you know like the people that need to be making judgments about the NHS need to use the NHS the yeah. people that need to make decisions about education need to have been through that process of what mm -hmm. state education is and why it matters and like it, we this idea that you know that I think the whole I've already gone there haven't I no, go, but like go. the ruling class thing go. the idea of like other people know better we know what's be best for you mm. just drives me crazy because because it's not true yeah. and it gets you into such bad and 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 you know to be clear that it shouldn't be the other way around it's not like you know that you know with with the sort of diversity and inclusion conversation it's not like it should be all a room full of different tokenistic people and no one mm -hmm. you, it, but it just there just needs to be representation it representation yeah. is what matters it's not about like having, it's just about going everything. It, it makes more sense. Like it just, it just makes more sense when, when things are represented. And I think, so for me, the world that I live in is in the world of the arts, but I also think culture is what shifts the, the conversation everywhere else in a way. Like I think what we see and the stories that we hear and all of that is very has a huge impact on what we the world and as we see it culturally as much as politics does actually like i think mm -hmm. conversa i think actually when you think about conversations around whether it's race or disability or this that and the other like i would imagine most people if they have had their minds changed or if they have opened up to um subjects or narratives or people that they wouldn't know about often it has come through stories it's come mm -hmm. through either you know it, like coronation street having the first having a trans character on there or something like that like yeah, yeah. then it's just like slowly ultimately everyone is scared of what they don't understand so ultimately it's norm normalization. So I suppose I've never really felt normal, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, even though I, you look at me and I probably am, but like the, the, that sense of the more though, it, it, the more these conversations are just normalized, you know, disability on screen or mm. anything like that is it, just, it's, it's just a part, it's just a piece is, that is there. It's not about, Hey, you're disabled, right? Make a day disabled show with only disabled people in it. Mm. It's just like going, oh look, there's a disabled person there, and we don't have to talk about it. But but because there are disabled people in the world yeah. <laughs> that exist, yeah. So like this idea of just going, it's sort of represent representation of of reality, I suppose. And it's it's really interesting because of what joining where we well, so I've got two hats on, haven't I? Because 
in the you're one in space. Both, yeah, you're in I mean, kind of the well, inclusion okay. world, but also in the arts as well. And I think what really, what I see in the arts and I think is that there are these identity markers that people mm. have and then they're very wedded to those. And so sometimes it can just be about being that one thing, which mm. obviously every individual is more than that identity marker, even if you have a couple of those. Well, it's also, it's like, it, it, like we sometimes we create a world where it's useful because you yes. go, you know, I'm a woman, I'm a woman of color. So here is a scheme for women of color. So yeah, yeah. I, you're kind of forced to identify in that way to get that opportunity. And the opportunity is great. Yeah. It's good that there is an opportunity, but it's also, it, it, like you say, it's kind of forcing you to being that and and, yeah. and 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 representing yourself and your work as that as that so that's the thing so you've got that side of it which i understand because of what you just said that mm. actually then you have opportunities that are opened up so you get those groups represented mm. and then the inclusion space when i'm talking to people and i'm trying to help them understand diversity actually Yes, you have those protected characteristics and that is a way of thinking about diversity. But if you think of diversity in those terms and it's just some of them or those people <laughs> over there, right? Mm, mm. Whereas actually diversity, where we talk about it, is identity because mm. every single person is unique. Yes. So there's 8 billion worth of yeah. expression of diversity in the world mm. because no two people are the same. There is no one like you, Ollie. <laughs> There's only one of you, right? So, <laughs> that, so <Thank> God. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's the thing. So I think it's really important to highlight, and that that's why I really love that you kept stressing representation. And this conversation is about it mattering because it really does. You need to see yourself in order to think, oh, I can achieve that. Mm. It, it makes a difference to have that. And it is really, really key. It would be amazing once we can balance things out to understand that, okay, well, just because I am a mm. woman of colour or whoever I identify, that actually the story doesn't necessarily have to be from that specific lens. And also the, can... then you also get into those weird things where you're like, the Tory party is now the most diverse cabinet we've had. And it's like, <laughs> well, it's not. <laughs> like, just because, you know, you... Yeah. Like, and actually, that's why I think, again, the conversation is complicated because actually it, it's so... It's so much about the human, like you say. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. yeah. If 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 all if if you've got a, a, a room and you've, there's a there's a South Asian person, a black person, a white person, and this person and that person, and a person in a wheelchair, but if they all went to the same school and they were all in the same class, <laughs> you're not going to get it, it's mm. it, it's diverse. It's visually diverse, maybe, but it's like mm. actually the it, that doesn't really help in terms of understanding more about people from different. If your culture is the same, yeah. no matter what your skin color or or your physical attributes, if your culture is the same, you're not necessarily going to understand mm. someone else's culture, mm. and and that can be class. You know, cl the class yeah. is huge. Like it's the difference massive. between yeah. people who have gone through a, the completely like private school system and edu you know gone through that way compared to someone that's been at a state school and left when they were 16 they they could look like twins but they're gonna their world is so far apart from mm. each other and I think that is where it again is the other thing is basically every system people find a way to game it right yeah. when so like and the people do that with diversity inclusion it's yeah. like oh well, look well this let's have this person this person and we're covered yeah. and but, but I, I, th I think that's right. And I, I think that the, the problem with the word diversity is a very damaged word now. Right? Mm. And, and I'm glad that we're having this conversation with someone who's so prominent in the arts, because to me, I think you have an amazing opportunity to drive cultural change. Mm. The thing about diversity is diversity is about difference, right? It's about yeah. your individual difference. Inclusion's a feeling. And that mm. is about how do you feel about being that difference. Mm. And what's interesting is, to your point, what happens is that what we want is we want diversity. We want difference providing you behave like us. 
So yes. you can be different as long as you're actually the same. Yeah, you can look yeah, different. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah, a bit like me exactly. saying, look how diverse we are. We've got this dress in black as well as white. It's the <laughs> yeah. same dress, just to be clear, but we've got it in a number of colours. Yeah. And I think the thing I like about the arts, because I think that um, your point about politics or any other, I think anything else I can think of, nothing quite has the power and the influence and the reach mm. that the arts does. Mm. I mean, I was thinking as you were talking, uh, now, he said it himself, so I think it's worth, it's certainly worth raising. Uh, Dennis Haysbert, do you remember there, who famously played President Palmer mm. in 24? He said that he believed that he was partly responsible for President Obama. And I think, there's a, I think that's right, right, right? Because you watched a black yeah. president and thought, oh, there's a black guy, there's a president, yeah. okay. And you watched it over a period of time and you kind of got socialized to that idea and thought, oh, okay. I, I, I really... You know, I mean, on the one hand, that you know, like, is a big claim to make. <laughs> uh, he, but he, he on the other he hand, he didn't say he got him elected. He said, know, he, but he said he opened the but, mind. To on the, the other point, hand, the I do actually sort of mm. agree. It's kind like, of interesting, I think isn't that it? idea of going present. You know, yeah, you're like you're you're presenting ideas and concepts, and actually, ultimately, what is art and what is storytelling? It's a it's a lesson in empathy. This is why it drives me crazy when when it gets taken out of schools and it's. And it's like seen as a, this luxury, you know, you go, why are we in the state that we're in? And why are we, you know, we were having all these conversations about people coming out of school and not being able to, you know, not being ready for work and like the kind of emotional aspect of it is like that because that's art. That's, yeah. that is art. And what that tells you, you know, you're, you're learning about other people through understanding them you are learning empathy which makes you a rounded human being mm. and also you know the the soft skills of being able to speak in front of people and do, look, ooh, there's so much in that actually which which keeps people back in their lives if okay. they don't have access to that job interviews you know creative thinking you know like going to university and, and like you're saying the the essay of here is a world and this, you know, that whole way of your brain creatively problem solving comes through art, the, the right. thinking abstractly, no, it's thinking massive. creatively. And we just take it out and go, let's put more maths in. Yeah, no, I, I solve our problems. I, I, no, I agree. And I, I mean, I'm conscious that we're, we're, we're going to be out of time shortly, which is a shame because it feels like we're just finding a way, <laughs> some really interesting stuff to talk to here. But I think that the, for me, the representation point, if I can just come back to mm. that, one of the things I really want you as directors and writers and creatives to do is to recognize that um it's one thing to have representation mm. but the problem is all too often when we come into the world we might be represented but in order to succeed we have to represent ourselves mm. so we have to represent ourselves as somebody that we're not we have to be whiter or quieter or straighter or whatever it might be yeah and actually what we want i think is we want on we want to see on stage on screen we want to see authenticity because that i think is what fosters the empathy you're talking about mm. i think that's what breaks down the stereotypes i was thinking and i forgot the name of it the show that um your girlfriend debs was in um you know the, the it's a sin I mean that mm. didn't that yeah, not yeah, yeah. did that not cause like wow. a conversation? It was incredible about things that. Wow. But how would you how would you have that conversation unless you did it through the arts? Look at the stuff mm. you do with our you know with theatre within our our world. You can introduce subjects through theatre that people can suddenly engage with mm. because we can engage with story. And I think the way that you really start to get that is by again it's so easy with inclusion and diversity to for it to be focused in an area of the bit you can see mm. so like a tv show will be like oh great look you know look at all the the you know black and brown faces in yeah, this yeah, tv yeah. show but if ultimately the person commissioning it and the person writing it and the person producing it if they if they're all that idea of having to to be able to be authentic you require it goes back to what we said at the start you require a safe space yeah. to be able for to do sure. that. For sure. and if you want to be you know this is why i think it's it's rare but when when you see it you you know when you look at like what michaela cole was able to do you go that is a space that she has been allowed to be authentic but what so often happens is is like you say you to to get into that space you have to acclimate you have yeah, to yeah, uh, yeah. change and, so, and right. so what what ends up happening is your the 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 actual 
on-screen representation or the stories being told are slightly skewed because they're yeah. being told because they have to be approved by sure. <laughs> whoever it is, you know. And yeah. I think that is, again, where that's our big, that's the challenge is to go, how do we, you know, and, and, and it's all steps, but it's getting those people is getting people into the decision the, the backstage and the decision making yeah. mm. places so that we can create those or or just making sure that those artists have that freedom to tell their their truth whatever that is you know so there, there may be something i guess that i'm thinking about here which is about two things have to happen simultaneously so on the one hand we might have to prepare the uh, production companies mm -hmm. and the commissioning agents to be able to welcome underrepresented diverse talent but we also got to prepare underrepresented underserved talent for that industry as well right yeah which is what you're sure. doing with wild child which is great um i know you're only able to mentor like half a dozen people <laughs> a year so there's going to be hundreds of people that go yeah. help 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 mm -hmm. what what would your maybe as a kind of takeaway piece what piece of advice would you give to someone from an underrepresented underserved community that was wanting to make a career in the arts what would you say and they've got the talent yeah i would say keep like keep making and creating don't get caught up in the space of like like weirdly what happens i think to a lot of people is when you start off you you know, when you think about being a writer or an actor, you just do it. You do every, you know, you sit and you would, I, you know, I would sit and I would spend my weekends writing mm -hmm. a film that no one is ever going to see or read, but like, because you do it because you're excited about yeah. creating. Then often what happens when you get to a, a level where you start to just get a foot in the door, then it's like, oh, well, maybe if I get this to write a treatment or that, and you, you, you stop, you stop creating and you stop writing because you're waiting for someone to give you the permission to yeah. do that. And actually the way that you, become really good at what you do is by just doing it you know it's the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours thing yeah, yeah like just don't let stop l waiting for other people feeling like someone else needs to give you permission like if you've, you've got this script in your head just write it it's mm. not going to be a waste of time um don't uh, this is maybe this is the message that, that I would give myself <laughs> but like if, Hmm. it's it's hard not to be impatient okay because you yes. want to you want it to move immediately yeah. and like I know how long things take and like if at the start of it you know like my, I would say on average it probably takes like five years for a tv show to get made because you sell it to this person then you change it and you rewrite it and you rewrite it again and again and again like if you enter into that and you're like this is gonna be five years <laughs> it's it's a long slog but it, like it just does take that time it takes things take time and actually find a way to just keep doing listen to yourself like try and be authentic and because the work is so much easier well, I, I learned that early on like I so when I started I did the playwriting course I did I did I was on the rural yeah. young writers course and you know it was like the Royal Court and then there were all these plays where everyone was sitting around their kitchen tables being working class and like talking about things. And I wanted to write weird <laughs> European <laughs> fairy tales and stuff. And I was like, okay, oh, this is what I need to do. So I tried to write yeah, like a kitchen sink working class. And I was just like, it just was so weird because it was like, this is sort of my part, a part of my life. And I'm, I, it just wasn't authentic and it wasn't good. And like, it took me a while to understand your relationship with yourself as an artist. And I think that is so important. The biggest, biggest tool you have as a writer is your subconscious. So I am of a, an opinion that the writing part should be easy. Mm. The thing that is hard is getting yourself into the position where the writing is easy. So if you're sat, if you're sat in front of a blank page and nothing's coming out, you're not ready. You got to fill the bucket. Yeah. Read, read podcast. This that. give yourself. I read this thing from um, Neil Gaiman the other day, mm -hmm. and he, when he talks about writing, he says he goes down to his shed, and he sits in front of his uh, sits at his desk, and he is allowed to not write, but but he 
but there are things that he's not allowed to do. He's not allowed to go on his phone. He's not allowed to read a book. He's not allowed to watch a TV show. He's not allowed to go on the internet. But he is allowed to not write. Mm -hmm. So then he can sit there and he can like daydream or whatever. And he just finds a point. You're just like, I'm putting I'm just writing now because it's quite boring. But it's so easy to be distracted by other things. But give yourself permission. Like if you're not ready, mm. reading a book, listening to a podcast, watching a TV show, anything like feeding your your subconscious and feeding your creative muse is never wasted time. And you should never feel guilty about that, I think. Mm. So I would say have patience. It, I mean, that's a useless piece of advice because I, I can hear myself arguing with my, I can hear like 22 <laughs> year old me being like, yeah, 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 sure. But I, I, I got this. I'll be fine. But I would think, I would say the main thing is just, is just make stuff, keep writing, whatever it is you want to do, like find a way to do it and don't, because Ultimately, that is the thing that drives you. And the opportunities, you know, come and they go. And, and you know, you have to put yourself, you know, like you, we've talked about this earlier, like yeah. it's hard to put yourself in that situation yeah. where you have those conversations. But ultimately, I think it's easier when you feel creatively connected. And when you've mm -hmm. got a script that you've written and you're feeling good about it, it's, it's, yeah. then it's easy to talk about. Because yeah. mm -hmm. you're like, but it's easier to do that than it is to talk about a an idea for a script that you think you might want to say to this person, you know, yeah. I got to a point, there was a stage in my career when I was like, I was just sort of starting to get commissioned for scripts when I would like, I would write the script and then I would like pretend I hadn't written the script so that I would get paid to write the script. That's <laughs> but I was like, I've already done it, That's but I, I won't tell you about it. But then I could go into those meetings and I would just be like, yeah, and then this, because I knew it. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I don't think, I don't have any confidence in anything until someone else tells me it's good. So I'll write something and I'll be like, oh, God, this is awful. And then I, so immediately, that's the other thing I would say, show people your work. I love it. Okay. Because I like, I like I write something and I'm like, oh, God, this is awful. I could so There were so many great scripts lying on people's hard drives. Show it to mm -hmm. someone and have someone go, this is great. My first play, Immaculate, I didn't finish. My first published play it was a play called Immaculate, which I wrote like three quarters of, and it just sat there. And this drama teacher at Tele Conti, Lisa Turner, at one point, I was just like, I showed it to her. She's like, this is great. You need to finish it. But I would never have finished that if someone else hadn't have said, "Yeah, That's this is wonderful. good, finish it. So show people your work. Great. That is wonderful. Well, we are sadly out of time. But you know what I'm going to take from this? I'll let you close. But I'm going to take from this is, as you were talking, I was just thinking to myself, writers just have to write. And yeah. I was just thinking to myself that, do you know what? Apple trees just bear fruit because they just do. And writers write because that's their fruit, right? So whatever's in you, let it water it, let it bear fruit. And if anybody wants to pick the fruit, great. If they don't, you're still an apple tree, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's lovely. I wish I'd have said that. <laughs> <laughs> I had time to think about it. <laughs> I, hand, I hand over to you to close because sadly we've got to go. But this has been beautiful conversation. It's been conversation. really lovely. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's been a great conversation. Thank you for everything, having me. Oh, everything you do with Wild Child and... We're going to put information up so people can find Amazing. these writers and yeah. Yeah, hire all, if you're, if you're in the industry, hire all these writers and directors because they're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.